Welcome class to Life of Christ. This is a, that course where we are going to explore uh, the person of Jesus. Uh, on your syllabus, this lecture uh, is going to be titled The Gospels in Their Context. And again, as I said, what you and I are going to be doing is seeking to better understand, to, to better wrap our heads around and have our affections stirred for who this Jesus is. It's, it's worth here at the front end of our course, just sort of stepping back and making something of an axiomatic observation. And that is this, there is no figure in all of human history that has shaped more lives, that has affected more lives, good or bad, right? There's no figure that has angered more lives than Jesus of Nazareth. Let, let's think about that. You and I, over the next two or three months, as we embark on this journey together to study the life of Christ, we are studying the singular person who has made the greatest impact on our world. Hopefully that will breed some humility and some curiosity in our souls. So, so let's begin our time together thinking about Jesus of Nazareth by not only sort of recognizing kind of where we are at in terms of how significant Jesus is, but also begin by recognizing how significant Jesus is in our world in light of the fact of how insignificant he should be. Hear me out. Let me, let me share with you a quote. I don't know how old it is, and I haven't been able to track down who actually said it. It's, it's often just attributed uh, to an anonymous source. But, but let me share it with you to sort of put some of this stuff in perspective. Here is a man, speaking of Jesus, here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village, he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30, and then for three years was an itinerant preacher. He never owned a home. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never put his foot inside of a big city. He never even traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of those things that usually accompany greatness. And then the anonymous author concludes by saying this, he had no credentials but himself. And yet here we are this morning, and this is what we're going to be doing for the next two or three months. We're going to give ourselves to understanding who this Jesus is. Now, since we want to know who Jesus is, we have to ask a fundamental question. Well, if we want to know about Jesus, how do we learn about Jesus? This is, this is a massively important question and, and one that I just think culturally we should make an observation. We sort of live in a world right now, particularly the younger you get, where we tend to think of ourselves as autonomous beings. We tend to think of ourselves as a law unto ourselves. This fleshes itself out in the way that we talk, for example. So stay with me here. If, if we were in person, if we were on campus, and I were to ask you a question like, well, how do you think Jesus would handle this situation, you know, if he was here today or whatever, something to that effect, okay? What I have found in my teaching experience is that most students' gut response to a question like that would be something like this. Well, Professor, I feel like Jesus would say this. Professor, I feel like Jesus would do this. And I mean this with all due respect, 
I don't care what you feel. I just don't. This is college. This is real life. This is academics. I'm not really interested in so much of what you feel about a particular situation. I'm interested in what you know. And I'm interested not just so much in what you know, but how do you know it? How do we know what we know about Jesus? Not, well, I sort of lay on my couch and I kind of have these feelings about Jesus. I sort of have this intuition. I have these kind of butterflies in my belly. Again, uh, every cult in the history of the world has started that way. There's always some charismatic individual who has a hunch or a feeling. And uh, yeah, that, that's not... <laughs> That's not how we ought to be thinking about these things. So the question is, how do we know about Jesus? And the answer is the Gospels. Let's put it this way. Let's say that you wanted to know something about Abraham Lincoln. Okay, let's say that you have a class on American history. I presume that you have taken one or that you will take one in your college experience. You have a class on Abraham Lincoln. How are you going to find out about Abraham Lincoln? When he was born, where he was born, what he did politically, what his family was like, how his life ended, what sort of impact he made upon those around him. What source are you going to go to that is going to be able to answer those questions for you? And, and the answer to that is actually pretty simple. We read biographies. That, that's what you want to do if you want to know something about Abraham Lincoln, is you would read a biography. That is sort of what we have when we come to the Gospels. In a sort of abbreviated way, what we need to recognize is that the canonical Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that the first four books that make up our New Testaments, they are, again, in an abbreviated sense, they are biographies. And to sort of turn the screw a little bit more, they are the only eyewitness testimony we have when it comes to this figure, Jesus. Think about that. Let that sort of settle upon you. The four canonical gospels are the only eyewitness testimony we have when it comes to the life of the most important figure who has ever existed. So my friends, the gospels are going to be ground zero for our understanding of who Jesus is. So let, let's talk very quickly about the four Gospels. Um, there, there are four Gospels, but we need to understand that while there are four Gospels, there is really only one Jesus. Okay, so we, we want to make sure that we don't fall into this trap of thinking, well, there are four Jesuses to match the four Gospels. That, that would be not just unhelpful, but it would actually be untrue. The Gospels actually come down to us in the original Greek, in terms of as far back as we can go to, to get to these manuscripts, they're titled, for example, The Gospel According to Matthew, The Gospel According to Luke, right? My, my point is, these are the same Jesus, but they are told from the perspective of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. While we're talking about the Gospels, and again, as we're sort of getting our feet wet and immersing ourselves into our course, keep in mind that the simplest way to catalog the Gospels is to recognize that within the canonical Gospels, we have what are called the synoptics, and then we have John's Gospel, okay? So synoptic Gospels include Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the reason that we call them synoptic is for the simple reason that the Greek word synopsis, from which we get our word synoptic, synopsis, synopsis simply means viewed together. And so when we speak of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what we're saying is that in a lot of ways, they resemble one another. 
right? And, and a, there's a lot of crossover, for example, in terms of the teaching of Jesus or the parables of Jesus or the, the miracles of Jesus. This isn't to suggest that, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't have their own distinctive emphasis. They do. But again, if we were to sort of scroll back, if we were to zoom out, if we were to kind of look at the Gospels from 30,000 feet, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they share a lot in common with one another. Let me, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and uh, share my screen so we can uh, look at a the presentation that I've put together. Bear with me here. Here we go. So what we want to recognize again is that we're, we're dealing with the four Gospels and the one Jesus. I, I, I put this together for you, uh, again, just to give you a view. When we're talking about these various portraits, what, what I want you to recognize is that that while they're all telling the same story about Jesus, they are telling, uh, again, a distinctive story. They're, they're going to highlight particular features. And so for Matthew, for example, his gospel is the gospel of the Messiah. He has a very distinctive Jewish emphasis. Uh, Matthew, over and over again, is uh, showing how Jesus, for example, fulfills Old Testament prophecy. Uh, we find on the other end, for example, the gospel according to St. John. Here, what is put before us is the gospel of the divine son who reveals the father, right? This is, this is the gospel in which if you want to know who the father is, then we need to look to Jesus, right? It's in John's gospel, for example, where we find that question. I believe it's Philip in John 14. He says to Jesus, Jesus, show us the Father. And what does Jesus say? Oh, oh Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, okay? You, you'll also notice on this slide, sorry, I don't know if you can hear that now, our lawn crew is outside my office and making ruckus. Matthew is the most structured gospel, Luke the most dramatic, Luke the most thematic, and John the most theological. If you look at the syllabus, you'll know that we're going to be spending uh, an individual class on each one of these gospels that will um, flesh that out a, a little bit later. Let me, let me go back also and, and, and say something that if I hadn't said already, I want to say. Um, it's important to recognize that when we're reading the Gospels, and particularly while we're reading them in their context, that the Gospels are not uh, contradictory records, but they're actually, again, complementary portraits. So, so to be redundant and, and to do so for pedagogical purposes, uh, we're, we're talking about the same Jesus, but we're telling that story in sort of distinctive ways. That's, that's what the Gospels are. And of course, that brings us to sort of another chapter in um, laying the groundwork for our course. And, and that is the question, well, what is a Gospel? And, and here, uh, I'm going to just hit on some of the, the information that Strauss laid out in the, the assigned reading. So you, this should be by, by way of review for you at this point. Strauss helpfully points out that um, a gospel, at least in what we're talking about in the New Testament sense of, of gospel, uh, it has uh, sort of three components to it. L let me back up really quickly. Recognize that the word itself, gospel, has a couple of different meanings. And so at least three, and I think Sproul brings this out in his reading. If not, it might be Strauss. Bear with me. Some of these things tend to bleed together. When I say gospel, I could mean one of three things, at least three things. On one hand, we need to recognize that the Greek word for gospel, which is the word euangelion, it simply means good news. So in the ancient world, uh, in the midst of a battle, okay, uh, your nation and a warring nation, if, if they were on the battlefield together, you didn't have the luxury of going to Twitter, for example, and getting updates. Are we winning the battle? Are we losing the battle? What, what's happening? Rather, there would be 
a runner who would leave the battle and he would run back to uh, the city and, and he would be running as fast as he could to deliver the message. And so he might come to the, to the wall of the city and let me in, let me in. I have news, I have news. I want to share with you Uangelion, good news. And in this context, it would be our troops have prevailed. We've, we've pushed back the enemy or something to that effect, right? That's one way that gospel can be used. Another way, and this is sort of a more technical way, and you find this later in the New Testament writings, gospel comes to be a word that refers to the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, for example, and you read in verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul tells us, well, this is the gospel that he preached, which was of first importance, right? And he goes on to say that, well, that Jesus died according to the scriptures, and then that Jesus was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. So, so in that sense, that's the gospel. Right? It's, it's sort of gospel is good news generically, and then there is gospel good news specifically. The good news is that Jesus has lived and died and resurrected and is reigning and will one day return. Right? That's good news. But there's another way, that, and this is the third way, and the way that we're using it when we talk about the gospels. And, and that is we're talking about a particular type of literature. And so again, Strauss fleshes this out. Uh, when you're looking at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, when you're looking at the Gospels, what we're saying is, first and foremost, for a Gospel to be a Gospel, it is history. That is to say, it refers to a specific historical context. When you read, for example, Luke's Gospel, he is meaning to convey to you accurate, truthful, historical information, okay? He's reporting the news. And we might say today, given our current climate, not fake news, regardless of what end of the spectrum politically you're on, but the point is he's, he's trying to give us news, information, truth. This stands in contrast to things like fables or allegories. The gospels are not fables, they're not allegories, they're not tales, they're not nursery rhymes, but they're history. They're telling us the truth about something that took place in time and space and history. Number two, the gospel is narrative. What, what this means is that they're literary works. They're stories, and particularly here, they're stories about Jesus. And then finally, we want to recognize that the gospels, again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're not just historical, they're not just narrative, they're also theological. What I mean by that is, the Gospels have an agenda. They have a bent to them. They're, they're, they're trying to tell you a particular story about Jesus because they want you to trust Jesus. They want you to believe in Jesus. Uh, what this is going to mean as well, when I talk about the Gospels being theological by nature, is that in some instances, uh, the Gospels break um, from sort of what we would consider today normal literary practices. So to return to our talk of biographies, if you were reading a biography again on Lincoln, you would sort of go into it assuming that the beginning of the biography would deal with the beginning of Lincoln's life and maybe go back into his family's life or the history of the United States, something to that effect. And then as you sort of work chapter by chapter through Lincoln's biography, you would assume that we're going to be progressing chronologically through Luther's life. Uh, Luther. Did I say Luther? I meant Lincoln. I'm getting Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, and Abraham Lincoln uh, mixed up. It's one of those days. Forgive me. I mean, I mean Lincoln. If I said Luther, that's not what I meant. I mean Lincoln. Um, you would expect sort of a chronological progression throughout Lincoln's life. This is where referring to the Gospels, the canonical Gospels, as strictly biographies it sort of breaks down. That is not necessarily how uh, stories were told in the ancient world, particularly from a Hebrew mindset. 
they were not handcuffed the way that we Westerners are here, 19th, 20th, 21st century by a strict chronological sort of reenactment or something like that. Uh, what the gospel writers do is they will rearrange and move things and reorder things and restructure things because that in their telling of the story, they have a theological sort of agenda that they want to communicate. We'll talk about this when we get into trusting the gospels and sort of trying to flesh out um, so the apparent uh, contradictions and inconsistencies. But let me just give you one really quick to give you a sort of a hook to hang some stuff on when I'm talking about theological agenda and maybe breaking from strict chronology. If you look at Matthew's gospel and you look in Luke's gospel, okay, Matthew and Luke, and you compare their um, temptation accounts, what you will find is that they differ. So all Mark tells us is that Jesus was tempted by Satan and that Jesus triumphed. Well, Matthew and Luke tell us that there were three separate temptations. And what Matthew does with his three and what uh, Luke does with his three is that they're not in the exact same order. And there's a reason for that. It's not a contradiction. It doesn't mean that we should chuck our Bibles. It doesn't mean that Jesus is a joke. It doesn't mean that the Gospels are unreliable. Again, we'll get into this in a subsequent class. I I'm simply sowing the seed for you now to let you know that the reason that those temptation accounts differ between Matthew and Luke is because Matthew has a theological agenda, and so does Luke. And so those temptation narratives have been structured in such a way to further that theological agenda. Okay, so for a gospel to be a gospel, when we're talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're saying these gospels record history, they're, they're a narrative, they tell us a story about Jesus, and then again, they have this sort of theological aim about them. Really quickly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend like five seconds on this because you should already have this again in your mind from the reading of Strauss. The way that we read the Gospels, there's a vertical reading, um, and then there's a horizontal reading. This goes back to what we were talking about with the temptation narratives. Reading the Gospels vertically uh, simply means that we are going to read the Gospels in isolation from themselves. In other words, I'm going to read Matthew, and I'm not going to consult Matthew, uh, Mark, or Luke and see how they handle this or how they structure. I'm just going to vertically, it's just top down. I'm only going to focus on this one Gospel. Reading the Gospels horizontally means that we're going to compare them, right? We're, we're going to, okay, in Matthew's Gospel, this is how Jesus um, dealt with this centurion woman and, and her faith. And this is the story, phone's ringing, sorry. This is the story in Mark and, and Luke. Uh, and so we'll, we'll look at them that way. Let, let me conclude, let me try to turn that off if I can. Sorry about that. Let me conclude with the um, some purposes really quick of the gospel. Let me give you seven of them, and then we'll we'll be wrapped up with this course, or with this lecture anyway. Uh, number one, what is the purpose of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Uh, we've already alluded to this. First of all, it is historical. The gospels intend to give us faithful accounts of what took place surrounding the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Number two. The Gospels are catechetical, catechetical. That means the Gospels were intended and used by the early church as a way to instruct new converts to the Christian faith. So we might say catechetical, we might say pedagogical. They, they were intended to, to teach new converts. Again, you got to remember, this is not a Christian world. This is the Roman Empire. You're, you're, you're talking about a Jesus to a bunch of people that have never heard the name of Jesus before. Well, the Gospels were sort of kind of ground zero for introducing people to Jesus. Number three, they were liturgical. That means that they were intended and used in the early church as part of their liturgy. Uh, the Gospels were read during their worship services. This was how the ancient people of God worshipped. Um, Christians have long been maligned as a people of the book. Well, that was originally intended to be a slur. Uh, 
hopefully Christians have embraced it as a compliment. We are people of the book. Uh, and so, yeah, Christians have used the Gospels as part of their services of worship for thousands of years. The Gospels are also, number four, instructional. They're aimed to do at least two things to believers. One, to encourage them, and two, to assure them. This is what the Gospels do. When we, when we read them, when we are taught from them, they encourage us to follow Jesus, and they assure us of who Jesus is. Fifth, the Gospels are theological. Again, they are meant to clearly communicate to us who Jesus is and what he did. Those questions are theological questions. Number six, they are also apologetic. Uh, the Gospels were routinely used to, uh, in the early church to combat heretical movements that would arise. Um, so whether you had a movement uh, that was really popular in the early church, uh, or at least in the first couple hundred uh, years of, of church history, would be a movement like Gnosticism. Uh, I hope you've taken your church history course by now. If not, you will be introduced to Gnosticism. And among other things, what Gnosticism purported was that essentially all things that are physical uh, or material or bodily uh, are in effect evil, right? So you sort of hear this uh, thinking in a lot of maybe Greek or Platonic thought where what is redemption, what is salvation? Well, it's sort of an escape from this world, right? And so uh, Gnostics would say something like, um, well, salvation is all about my soul escaping the prison house of my body, right? And the reason that they would think like that is because in that worldview, the body, which is physical, was evil. It, it was unnecessary at best and evil at worst. Well, one of the things that the Gospels focus on is the incarnation of the Son of God, the infleshing of the Son of God. So, so uh, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, he takes to himself, he really does assume a human nature. And so when you have a movement like Gnosticism rising up and, and seeking to influence Christianity, well, again, ground zero for this was the Gospels going, no, it, it, Jesus, he, he didn't think, you know, the, the God of the Bible doesn't think that bodily stuff is bad or evil. It, he took on flesh right? So, so th these things were used in that vein, in an apologetic uh, manner. Lastly, they were evangelistic. Uh, they were and they remain to be evangelistic. What I mean by that is that the gospel writers were deliberately seeking to persuade those who read them to embrace Jesus. In fact, if you look at John's gospel, he tells us, I believe it's in John 21, 20, or either, maybe it's in John 20, 31, one of you can look that up and, and put it on the populi and correct me. But uh, the Gospel of John is clear in his aim, and that is that those who would believe in the name of Jesus would know that they have eternal life. And so, again, the Gospels don't merely want to communicate to you sort of information. It's not just data dump. But, but the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they want you to trust Jesus. They want you to follow Jesus. Let me uh, come back here. So uh, I hope this has been beneficial for you. I'm going to post a couple of things on Populi and do my best to get on that discussion board. 10% um, of your grade for this course is going to be class participation. Well, we're not having a lot of that since, uh, you know, we're not in the same class. And so what that's going, how that's going to flesh itself out for your grade is um, on Populi after lectures, I'm going to be posting sort of questions and discussion topics and things like that. And you are expected to respond and engage and, and to, to thoughtfully not just sort of kind of wrestle with what I put out there, but one another, uh, different students in the class on these discussion boards. So I'll post some of those things a little bit later uh, today. Um, so that you should have these available. Okay, I will, I'll see you next time. God bless.